Hello, creepy friends, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for my April reading wrap up. As always, in the visual, you'll see me doing the final uh, update of my April reading journal. And in the voiceover, I'll give you a quick review of all the books that I read in April. Again, I'm on a roll in my reading, and I pretty much read nothing but decent or really good books in April. So stay tuned in for all those great reviews. In the month of April, I read eight books with a total of 3,127 pages, and I read 22 out of the 30 days. Four out of the eight books that I read were written by people of color. And as far as the author countries, one of them was written by a Taiwanese author, and all the rest were American. My average rating for the month was 4.38. The top genres were sci-fi, LGBTQ, speculative, and magical realism, and my top moods were dark, tense, funny, reflective, and adventurous. Now let's move on to the reviews. Just a spoiler warning, if you don't want any spoilers at all, when you get to the point where I am writing my reviews in my journal, do not read what's on the screen. However, all of my voiceover reviews are spoiler free. Dahlgren by Samuel R. Delaney. Read this if you're looking for a classic of sci-fi and speculative fiction written by a queer black man. Dreamlike stream of consciousness writing style, ergodic literature that includes sections of poetry and journal entries, an unconventional timeline that keeps you feeling unmoored and unsure, and a post-apocalyptic setting in a Midwestern US city, but we don't know what happened. This book is a lot. It's very hard to describe, and there are a lot of parts that I did not enjoy, but it is definitely completely unique among the books that I have read. So first we'll go over the things that I liked, and then things that I really did not like. So what I liked. The prose was very interesting in this book, and you really feel like you're in some kind of fever dream. The nameless main character, known as The Kid, arrives at a fictional Midwestern city where something apocalyptic has happened. It's unclear what occurred, or if it has affected the rest of the U.S. or the world. There are very beautiful descriptions of surrealist visions and a ton of descriptive metaphor. However, like many others who have read this book, I didn't feel like I was completely getting it. Many of the characters are interesting and feel like they could be real people in that situation. However, I didn't find anybody particularly likable. Delaney does a great job of painting the picture of this post-apocalyptic landscape and the lengths that people go to. You really feel like you are there in the setting, in all of its disgusting, smelly glory. The timeline of the book is always shifting, and you aren't ever really sure the order of events, giving you an uncomfortable sense of disconnection. In fact, the first line of the book is a continuation of the last line of the book. Now, what I didn't like. There are so many sex scenes in this book, and a lot of them are minor adult relationships. I'm not sure what Delaney was attempting to convey with all the sex scenes, but I felt that there were way too many of them and they were way too long. Eventually, I was getting bored of them and I started skipping through them after the first half of the book. There are also several situations with dubious consent, although it seemed like that was purposeful by the author. One positive though, is that there were a ton of queer relationships shown. I have a feeling that Delaney was making a point with these scenes and I just wasn't getting it, but I have a lot of difficulty reading about minor and adult relationships. Additionally, there are a ton of racial slurs, like all over the place, so also be aware of that. Ghost Station by S.A. Barnes this was an ARC review, and the publication date was April 9th, 2024. Read this if you're looking for a sci-fi and horror novel, a female main character with a checkered past, a mysteriously abandoned station on a frozen planet, something moving under the skin, psychological horror as in you can't trust what you're seeing and hearing, greedy corporations doing something shady, and alien ruins. This is the second sci-fi horror novel from S.A. Barnes, and I really enjoyed it. 
Our main character, Ophelia, is a psychologist with some terrible incidents in her past. So in order to escape, she signs on to an exploration team who are tasked with surveying a far planet that has ancient alien ruins in order to determine if it has val valuable resources. The team she joins also has had a recent tragedy in their past and are not friendly to having a corporate psychologist delving into their business. After they arrive at the planet and start to use the abandoned station that a previous survey team has established, very strange and terrifying events begin to occur. The team can no longer trust their own minds, unsure if they are seeing and hearing things that aren't there, and the black alien ruins seem to be calling to them. Barnes does a great job of building the suspense and the creepy atmosphere of the station and the planet. The body horror is real in this one, so look into the content warnings a little more if that is something that bothers you. I enjoyed how the story also delved into corporate greed and corruption, and how that harms workers and average folks. The main character does have a traumatic past and seems to have anxiety and some anger issues. As we are in her head in this book, sometimes it did become a little repetitive to hear her continuously trying to control her emotions. Overall, this was a super creepy and fun read if you enjoy space horror or S.A. Barnes' previous novel, Dead Silence. The Membranes by Ji Dawei. Read this if you're looking for speculative fiction set in the near future, written by a queer Taiwanese author. A future where most people live in habitats under the sea, beautiful and evocative writing, sapphic relationships, exploration of personhood, autonomy, family relationships, and corporate greed, a whole lot of metaphor, and an interesting reveal at the end. This is a sad and contemplative speculative novel written in the 1990s, and the author has some prescient predictions of some of our future technology. The novel follows our main character, Momo, who is a well-known and sought-after dermal technician who helps the rich and famous remain youthful and beautiful. In this near future, we have destroyed our environment on the surface, and most people now live in habitats on the ocean floor. Momo is a mysterious figure who seems to isolate herself, never leaving her home studio, and who appears to be emotionally and physically detached from society. As we learn more about Momo, her past, and her relationship with her mother, we start to see some things that don't seem to add up. This was a quick and engrossing read with beautiful lyrical writing and a ton of visual metaphor, including a beautiful depiction of Momo as a baby being birthed from a peach. It delves into parent-child relationships and the difficult decisions that parents sometimes have to make to save their children, as well as the corporate corruption and greed that can put families in these difficult situations to begin with. Additionally, this is considered a seminal work of queer literature in Taiwan, depicting the disconnection from society and feelings of not meeting expectations that queer people may feel. This was a gorgeous and melancholy book, and I recommend it to those who enjoy more philosophical, speculative writing. The Change by Kirsten Miller. Read this if you're looking for a feminist story where women develop powers when they reach menopause, middle-aged women as protagonists, terrible men getting their comeuppance, witches and botanical magic, ghosts, and responding to hot flashes by walking around in the nude outside. This novel is a fun and humorous tale of revenge. We have three main characters, middle-aged women, who are going through the change. As they transition to menopause, they begin to discover that they are gaining some interesting powers. They all live in a community on Long Island, and through a series of events become friends. One of them begins to see ghosts of murdered young women and girls, and the three begin a mission of justice and revenge, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. I am the target audience for this book, so I really enjoyed it and identified with the characters. I do love a good-for-her book, and I'm white and entering middle age. One of the three main characters is Black, and there is a lot of discussion of how the victims in the book have been targeted because many of them are poor or non-white. So I think the author did a pretty good job there. However, this book is definitely written from a white, middle-class point of view, so just be aware of that. 
I really loved the depiction of the caring relationships between the women and how they had each other's backs no matter what. The descriptions of the characters were great, especially the annoying and misogynistic male characters. They definitely felt like people that I have met in real life. Overall, this was great fun, and I really appreciate any book that centers older women as the main characters. All Systems Read by Martha Wells. This is book one in the Murderbot Diaries. I am mentioning the Murderbot Diaries for the third time in one of these wrap-up videos, so I'm not going to go into it, but suffice it to say, I love the Murderbot series. I just reread all of them. And if you want a little bit more explanation, check out my February reading wrap up. The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House by Audre Lorde. A quote from this essay. For the Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. Audre Lorde described herself as black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. This work is a very short essay that was one of Audre Lorde's talks at a feminist conference in 1979, and you can read it in about 15 minutes. You can find it published on its own or in Lorde's collection of essays titled Sister Outsider. This is an important essay that is emphasizing the importance of intersectionality in feminism. Lord pointed out that feminism is weakened when the particular needs and experiences of poor women, third world women, women of color, and lesbians are ignored. Lord was well known as a critic of second wave feminism, which mostly focused on the liberation of white, middle, and upper class women. This is a seminal text of intersectional feminism if you want to start learning about intersectionality, this is a great place to start. It's a quick read, so I'll leave it here, but I'll also leave you with one final quote. What does it mean when tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow perimeters of change are possible and allowable. Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby Read this if you're looking for an emotional story of loss and atonement, older men having to reckon with their homophobia after their gay sons are killed, exploration of parent-child relationships, homophobia, and white supremacy, a humorous and heartwarming friendship between the two main characters, and vigilante justice. I love everything I've read so far from S.A. Cosby, and this is no exception. This book was a big hit last year, so I'm a little behind but this is the story of two homophobic older men, one black and one white, who are forced to reassess their prejudices when their gay sons, who were married and had a young child, are murdered. Buddy Lee is kind of a white trash drug dealer type, and Ike is a former gang member, and both of them have spent time in prison. They meet at their son's funeral and team up to find out who killed their sons and to exact revenge. The characters are very well written, and Ike and Buddy Lee have some of the best banter I've read. The relationship between the two of them is even sweet at times. As one would expect, this book deals with very heavy topics, including homophobia, transphobia, hate crimes, white supremacy, and murder. The emotion felt by these fathers can be deeply felt by their reader, as they grapple with regret and grief after the loss of their children. One particularly memorable scene shows Ike and Buddy Lee going to a gay bar to try to collect some information, and Ike having almost a panic attack, having to be in an environment that is so foreign to him, with his homophobia and insecurity getting the better of him. This book has many touching and emotional moments as well. It is extremely well written and really depicts some of the reality of the complex relationships between parents and their queer children. If you're able to handle the content, this book is a must read. The Adventures of Amina Al Sarafi by Shannon Chakraborty. Read this if you're looking for a fantasy pirate novel set in the Muslim world, including Oman, Yemen, and Somalia, swashbuckling, seafaring, poisoning, and explosions, a middle aged POC female main character, magic and sea monsters, an accidental marriage to a demon a fun and endearing cast of characters, and transgender representation. 
If you told me that a fantasy pirate story would be one of my favorite books of the year so far, I wouldn't have believed you. But Chakraborty hit it out of the park with this one. Amina al-Sarafi is a middle-aged and retired pirate living a fairly quiet life with her mother and daughter, when a rich woman shows up at her door to convince her to find the woman's supposedly kidnapped granddaughter. From there, the action begins and doesn't stop until the very end. Amina is a funny and strong main character, and she gathers her former crew, gets her ship back, and goes out on an adventure that is full of magic and monsters. I love the setting of this book, and you can tell that Chakraborty did a ton of research to get the historical time period and the Middle Eastern setting to be convincing. The main character and several others are Muslim, and most of the characters are people of color. There is also queer and transgender representation as well. Chakraborty's writing is engrossing and easy to get absorbed in, and the characters are so fun and endearing. Because I cared about the characters, the stakes were high and the story was suspenseful. This book does take quite a large turn into the fantastical in the second half of the book. I saw that some reviewers thought that it was a bit over the top, but I loved it. The book ends in such a way to set things up for the rest of the series, and I can't wait until Chakraborty writes the rest of these. I will pick them up as soon as they come out, and I'll be checking out Chakraborty's previous series as well. And that does it for my April reading wrap up. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and leaving me a comment down below. If you read in April, let me know what your favorite book of the month was. And if you'd like to check out any of the books that I've mentioned, I have links to all of them in the description box. Please join me in a week from today when I'll be releasing the video for the setup of my June reading journal. And then the week after that, I'll have the setup for my June bullet journal. As always, you can find more book reviews and more journaling content on my other social media channels. My handle on Instagram and everywhere else is biblio underscore creep. I hope to see you all again soon. Remember, be kind to yourself, drink your water, take a rest, give yourself some time to do the things that you enjoy, and I'll see you next time. Bye!